I know it's, uh, some of you might have been to some of my prior um, sessions, and they were a little bit more formal, educational, kind of get up like a teacher and go down the line of what you have to do to make money. I'm changing it up today, and um, we're going to talk literally about what I think most racers and most people seeking sponsorship don't understand. And what I learned in my big aha moment, which helped me go from really struggling and trying to trying to knock on doors and sell sponsorships all the time to starting to make millions um, from race, from for the race teams and for the properties through sponsorships. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Alex Schreiler. I graduated from college back in the 80s. I don't even remember what day anymore. Went off to New York City, worked as an investment banker for a while. Uh, thought I was rich, came back, started an internet business. After five years, it blew up, and I totally went broke. Then I went off and went and became the president of Osiris Shoes. Hated selling shoes, so I moved over to the racing industry, which I've been in ever since 2005. It's really fun. It's my passion. I love it. I worked with Championship Off-Road Racing as the director of sales and marketing, selling sponsorships and marketing and bringing in money. Then moved over to Lucas Oil. Did that for eight years. Lucas moved here to Indy. I'm from San Diego. It's not a good fit. So now I just educate racers, sanctioning bodies, tracks, promoters, teams, how to raise money from sponsorships. And it's, it's a system that I learned just by doing it. It's a system that works for me. And at Lucas, a lot of teams, I mean, we, we probably had 600 race teams a year that would come up that we either had to renew or, or consider. There's like 6,000 that we had to consider for sponsorship. And everybody approached us wrong. They weren't showing the value that Lucas Oil needed in order to be sponsored by Lucas. So I wrote a book called Motorsports Marketing and Sponsorships that we gave out to our race teams. I think I handed out 650 books over the years uh, to racers and teams on how to get sponsorship. And I get a lot of feedback from that. So using the feedback, I started putting together these seminars and started selling uh, helping racers sell sponsorships. Uh, when COVID hit last year, I made zero dollars selling sponsorships. It was the worst year ever in the history of me uh, uh, getting any kind of an income. So I took the business and I went online. And now I'm trying to educate. What's going on? Thanks for coming yesterday. <laughs> so, now, so now I take the business online. I'm trying to educate anybody who has a connection as opposed to just people who come in and listen to the seminars and who sit in the audience and listen to some of the presentations. I, uh, I've been speaking for PRI for, I don't know, it's like my fifth or sixth one doing these. Uh, and I'm getting some feedback that I think is valuable and I'm gonna share with that, that with you today. So sponsorship is not really about the money. I mean, it is because we all want more money, but the reality is you guys are gonna race anyway. You are, and you are racing right now without money. So what can you do to make more money? If you look at sponsorship as something that's going to establish you and put you in a league and in a class of professionalism, you're going to get respect and credibility, status and leverage. When you're walking down the pits and you're wearing, proudly wearing logos of the brands that you represent, hopefully one big one and some smaller ones, but hopefully one big one is what you really want. It puts you in a category where now you, you don't have to look for money anymore. Now you can spend your time practicing, tuning your car. You can spend your time networking. And the networking is not just with teams and you know, fans, but you can network with your sponsor's business partners. Imagine if you're sponsored by Target, how many potential connections you can make through that because of all the brands that are sold in Target. Think about that. So picking the right sponsor is far more important than picking just any sponsor. And looking at the money is the wrong way to look at it to start because you want to look at the, your, your first sponsor. Your, I call them the anchor tenant. That's just the word I've kind of come up with. But your anchor sponsor, the first big one, you want to look at that as an opportunity to reach other sponsors and as the hub and maybe the, the gateway to start bringing in more money by creating more value. The one thing you don't want to do, though, is offer exposure. That's what I tried that for like four or five years I was at, with Core. I sold exposure, exposure, exposure. Some of you guys know the story. When I went to American Express with Adrian Cheney, he flew me out to New York City. We met with the top dogs at American Express, and they kept saying, 
you know, we're interested. Adrian raced as a Pro 4 at the time he raced in the Core Series, then he went to Lucas Oil. Um, and at American Express, there's three people in the room, three of them, with Adrian and myself. And uh, they kept saying, well, we're starting this new credit card. I think it was like the black card or something, the, the American Express black corporate card. And you know, what can you do to open more corporate card accounts? Well, we're going to put your logo on our helmet, race suit, and the race car. They're like, well, what are you going to do to open more accounts for us? How are we going to sell more credit card? How are we going to get more credit card customers? Well, you're going to have banners at all the racetracks, and you're going to get some TV time. And, we're gonna, and we never answered their question of how are they going to get more credit card holders. That's all they wanted. All we had to do was say, well, we'll collect names and give you the leads, and then perhaps that could have led to a sponsorship. We walked away from that meeting because we met somebody. We felt like, oh, this is good. We met them. They know us. Now we're going to get a sponsorship. You ever feel like that? You meet somebody, and then because you've met them, you, you have a good feeling like, oh, this is good. I gave them a deck. You know, maybe I'll get a sponsorship. And then nothing. You're ghosted. Well, that's what happened. Happens all the time. Happened to me probably 2,000 times in the first few years I tried to sell sponsorships, and it's frustrating. Sometimes it even pisses you off. You know, you get all mad, and then you go and you give them negative reviews or, uh, you know, and, and that just then compounds the problem and makes it worse. What I eventually learned after doing this for a while is that there's a difference, a huge difference, between decks and proposals. Don't give someone a deck if you're proposing to them uh, an official relationship, and don't give somebody a proposal if you're just trying to get to know them and start a relationship. There's a huge difference. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. <clears throat> Just as a, an example that this does work, a few, a couple months ago, um, someone who I don't know, Jason Coleman from Coleman Motorsports, went through a program that, you know, was listening to one of these, and, and he listened to an online program. Next thing you know, he gets on a phone call, and we do a 30-minute review, and I looked at his deck, and I said, well, here's how you want to do it. Uh, two months later, I found out he's now the iBox Springs Trophy Truck. It works. The system honestly works. It's not something that it might happen, it's something that legitimately does happen, can happen, and you guys can do it too because I was literally in your shoes where I sat there for months and months and months trying to figure out what am I doing wrong, you know, does, does, do they not like me? I started to take it personal. I give someone a deck and then don't hear from them. It's frustrating because you spend a lot of time on looking for sponsors, and it's the time that you spend that you could be doing other things. Well, I think that if you focus your time on a logical process and look at sponsorship as a business because the sponsors that you're trying to get money from are businesses and they're trying to make more money. So your job is to become an extension of their marketing arm. It's to help them reach areas, whether it's a demographic or a geographic or a new customer that they don't already reach. And if you can do that, then there's no reason for them not to sponsor you. The problem is you have to communicate that to them. And how do you communicate to a new company that you're going to bring in new business to them? Well, that actually starts with a deck. Decks start the relationships. There's a couple slides, I think, that will say that. And then proposals close the deals. When I realized the difference between decks and proposals, that's actually when I started making a lot of money, and you guys can too. It's not that hard to do. Once you do that, suddenly you now have respect. You have status. You can now walk proudly and sign autographs. You, you feel better. And when you feel better, you act better. It's, it's, it's actually a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's a snowball that rolls. Um, you don't also have to chase money anymore because now you're, you're making money, and you can spend your time doing better things. Don't worry about taking notes. I see a lot of people taking notes back there. Don't worry about it. Um, I did something I was telling Don earlier. I'm going to give everybody in this room, at least through PRI, is going to get a copy of my book for free. It's an e-book, not the physical book, because that costs me a lot of money. But if you go to my website, <laughs> it was a bad year last year, guys, <laughs> as you know, right? <laughs> it's a really bad year. So the e-book is free. Um, the only thing that's not in it is the valuation section, because that's changed. The valuations are different today than they were last time. And that's it's a whole other seminar. I don't have time today to get into that. 
But I was speaking with Dan, um, who runs the PRI educational program, and I think what we might do is do a, um, an all-day seminar that goes over everything. How to make decks, how to write proposals, how to value your assets, how to approach a company, do's and don'ts of trade shows. I, I think at some point we will do a seminar like that. We haven't yet, but go to alexstryler.com. My son set it up a week ago. Click the button and you can download the ebook. The technology is not perfect. It's not great. I'm trying, you know, I'm, I'm not a tech guy, but I have a son who's helping me and I think it works. If it doesn't, please reach out to me and I'll make sure that you get a copy. So let's back up for a second and let's start at the beginning. Decks and proposals are two different things. Decks are for marketing. Your deck is to start a conversation. And that conversation hopefully leads to a relationship. Once you have a relationship, once you get to know somebody, once you feel comfortable and you know what they want and they know who you are and they know what you can offer, then you can propose to them. You don't propose to someone you don't know. It's silly, it's, it's ridiculous. They're never gonna say yes. The reason why you guys aren't getting callbacks is because you're handing proposals to companies that don't know you. Somebody proposes to you tomorrow, are you gonna say yes until you get to know them? No, neither are they. So when you create a deck, you want to create decks that are gonna attract attention, make people want to be part of your race program. You wanna create decks that are enticing and engaging. It's like giving out free candy. You know, it's Netflix lets you have a free membership first. They get you sucked in. Once you're sucked in, then they sell you the annual program. That's what you have to do as well with your deck. The deck is a visual tool to meet somebody. They open doors. The proposal, on the other hand, that's more of an official document, and that closes deals. And proposals, you have to be careful because the proposal may very well become a legal contract. So what you put in a proposal is often cut and pasted into the contract. It's called the Schedule A at the end of a contract, which are the deliverables that you're promising to give a sponsor if they give you money, or if they give you product, or if they start a relationship. So remember that. You wanna be very careful what you put in a proposal because you might be legally bound by it. What's up, Peter? So the, I was thinking, I was thinking recently on how best to create the mental image. But you guys know, as a racer, you have assets. You have tangible assets, the things that you can touch and feel. And that's, you know, logos on your car. You can hand out coupons. You can collect data. You might get TV time. You might get track time. You might appear in a magazine. You might appear, you, you might do an interview in the grandstands. And, and that all benefits your sponsor. That's physical, tangible assets. And that stuff can be valued. And that's what goes in a proposal. And that's how you determine how much they're gonna pay you and what you're worth. Your intangible assets, those are priceless. Intangible assets are, I'm gonna go to this other slide real quick. There are things like fan affinity. Do the fans love the series? Think about NASCAR fans. You know, I'm not gonna buy at Lowe's because I love Tony Stewart and he's only Home Depot. Well, that's fan affinity. That, that's an intangible asset that has value. Your integrity, think of Ron Capps with Napa. You know, there's, there's some, some racers who have this feeling about them that you can't put a dollar on, but it has value. Those are your intangibles. What's the reputation? Your reputation and also the, the reputation of the series. What kind of opportunities can you provide through the series in terms of networking? What brands can you introduce the sponsor to that are also involved in the series that the sponsor might be able to do business with? Um, relevancy, I think, is important because if you approach a sponsor that has no business in racing or doesn't sell to race fans, then there's no relevancy. So those are intangible assets. Series strength is very important. A lot of series go broke. You know, World Rallycross, Lucas Oil Off-Road Racing, the Drag Boat Series, they, they come, they go. And so sponsors usually don't want to be part of something that might not have long-term viability. So your intangible assets are what you show in the deck. That's how you get started. I'll try to back up here now. The decks get attention. And to show the intangibles, you don't have to write any words. You don't even have to put numbers or dollar values to anything. Use pictures. I tell everybody, use images. Images are everything, because a picture is worth a thousand words. So in your deck, you wanna show the integrity, the fan affinity, you wanna show the excitement. 
because the deck is just to get to know somebody. That's how you're going to start that relationship. So separate your assets at the beginning, what you have now that's going to attract attention versus what you're actually going to offer and physically do if they say yes. And those are your tangibles. We're going to get to those in just a minute. This slide I put up because this is sort of how the whole process works. The decks get attention. That's, that's what you want, is you want them to first get attention. You want, to, you want to, hey, excuse me, look at me, it's me. And then now you got their attention, now you want to meet them. Once, once you meet someone, then you can start a conversation. But it has to go in that order. You don't want to start a conversation before you know somebody because then your voice on the phone or your baby text in an email or text in a message. How many times have you ever bought something for a lot of money from a text or an email? I haven't. Sponsors don't. You've got to get to know them. So the, the, the deck creates that relationship. At least that's the purpose of the deck. And if you always remember, your deck is to create that relationship and just get the relationship started, then you can become friends and you can get to know the sponsor and they can get to know you. You can understand what adds value to them. They know what value you can offer. And now you can start talking about how to work together. But you don't want to propose to them until you know them and they know you. When you do propose, though, you want it to be good because you got one shot. And if you don't propose well, they're going to say no. If your proposal is too good to be true, they usually say yes. I'll show you how to do that in just a minute. <clears throat> Start with decks. Show in the deck how you're going to be a tool for the company's marketing. Show your intangibles. We just did that. And then you write a proposal. The thing with the proposal, though, is when, the propo when you give a company a proposal, it doesn't just sit with the marketing director. The marketing director will take it, look at it. That's your gatekeeper. That's your gatekeeper to the CFO. And then if the CFO goes, oh, financially, we can probably do this, then it goes to the CEO or the president. And then they make a decision. Hmm, is this someone we want to work with? Well, if what you're giving them is professional and it has value, then yes. Often they do. And I think about half the time that I write a good proposal, they say yes. I don't know the exact number, but I'm going to guess it's half the time. And that's up from like 2 to 5% before. At the beginning, before when I sent everybody a deck, and I thought the deck and the proposal were the same thing, I'd had maybe a 2 to 5% success rate. <clears throat> what you put in the proposal are things that you can viably do and offer your sponsor. Now, a lot of series are not on television. You usually don't start that way, but that has the most value. So if you can somehow get television, that's what you want to do. Your, your goal is to give as much value to a sponsor through your racing that they can move their marketing dollars over from other areas and give it to you instead. So most companies have a media budget. A lot of companies run commercials. A lot of companies run ads, whether they're magazine ads or now social ads on, online. A lot of companies do that. If you can show them that giving you the money instead and you're going to spend their money and promote them through your media, then they're not spending any more money. They're just moving it over. You don't want them to add to their budget. You want them to reallocate their budget away from what they're currently doing to what you can do for them. Because then it doesn't cost them anything. Then there's no reason for them to say no. Think about that for a second. Hey, Mr. Marketing person who spends a million dollars anyway, give me 100,000, spend 900 the way you are, give me 100, and here's what I'll do for you. And I'm gonna create 500 of value and here's how I'm gonna do it. That's the goal. That's the only thing that's gonna get you a sponsorship. Randomly handing out Marketing prop propaganda and material to people doesn't do anything. But when you do give someone a proposal, you have to show value in that proposal. So how do you do that? Well, there's your tangible assets, the things that you can physically and viably do. It's not about the logo on your car. They don't care. But if you can get good pictures of the car that appear in publications or online, or if you can take your car to uh, autograph signing at a big retail store and people come in, and they take pictures and they post it, now there's media value. You know, now you just gave them many impressions that you can quantify. 
If, if you get a 30-second interview on the local news, that has value. And you compare that 30-second interview to what it would cost them to buy a 30-second commercial. All right, local, local ABC News, it cost me $3,000 for a 30-second commercial. If you can get a 30-second interview, you just gave them $3,000 of value. You got to look at it like that. Um, there's a lot of things that you can offer. Some, some series have onboard cameras. If you can get articles, which is really key because it's super easy, you just have to approach a magazine to get written about. That's all you got to do. There's hundreds of magazines out there. Still, many of them are online now, but a lot are still physical. All you have to do is approach a magazine, get to know a writer of the magazine, and they'll write something. Give them, give them a story about you that has photos of you with your, with your sponsor's livery in it. If you do that, now you have value again. Now you can show, okay, you know, a full-page ad in, I don't know, let's say Dirt Sports Magazine, that might be $7,000. Well, if you can get a full-page article, you can show $7,000 of value. So then you start to add up the value, 30 seconds of TV time, full-page ad, blah, 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 all this other stuff I do. A lot of times you can just go to your series and, and say, hey, Mr. Promoter, Mr. Sanctioning Body, uh, I have this new sponsor, I'm really trying to get them. They have 50 people they want to bring in. They want to bring in customers. Can I have some tickets? I've never heard a series say no to that. Now, sometimes they do, oh, you have to buy the tickets, here's a discount. But honestly, if, if you can show them that you're going to bring in money for yourself, and then the series thinks maybe one day that transfers over to them, they'll give you tickets. So you can add the value of the tickets up. There's a lot of things that you can do that creates value on your tangible assets. One of the big things is also inclusion in the ads of other sponsors. If you have a current sponsor and you know they're going to run ads with you or promote you, and you can show your new sponsor in those ads or promotions, that has value. And then again, look at the media rate. Every magazine, every TV show, every, every network, um, every race program has a media card. If you want to purchase ads in it, and so get the media card and get the media rate so that you have a comparable value, and then you can determine by adding up all the different values, you know, what your program is worth. Never give someone a proposal and say, hey, I need $10,000, that's how it's going to cost me to race. They don't care how much it costs you to race. They care how much value they can give to them, and if you can reallocate what they're already spending to the value that you're going to offer, it's a no-brainer. There, there's no reason for them to say no. That's what I learned. And when I, did, when I learned that, that's when I really started selling a lot of sponsorships. Some of the other things you want to include in a proposal are other committed sponsors because I always found that most of the marketing directors that I, I dealt with, yes, they want to sponsor a series or they want to sponsor a racer or a team, but they also want to meet the other sponsors. When Bill Stein came aboard the Luxol Off-Road Racing Series, the marketing director, Bill Stein, his big objective was to meet Toyota. Toyota was our official truck. And Bill Stein said, look, we want to sponsor the series, but you have to put us next to Toyota at all the events. All right, that's easy. Doesn't cost me anything. Boom, made it happen. They weren't interested in the exposure or the logos. They just wanted to meet Toyota. So can you make relationships, introductions from one sponsor to the next? That's key. So you're proposing you'll have your tangible assets and you'll list them and it'll show value, but there's some legalese and some things that you have to put in it, such as, you know, will the sponsor be exclusive in the product category? This is really especially true for tire companies and energy drinks. They usually, oil companies, they usually don't like to see their competitor in the same vehicle and that's, you know, kind of it's a no-brainer, but you'd be surprised how many times people get that wrong and they start looking for sponsors of their competitors you know, or sponsors who are competitors to their current sponsors, it's, it's kind of foolish. So you need to include who your current sponsors are, whether they can be exclusive, obviously, you know, what kind of signage, banners, wraps, all that stuff. Um, a big one for a lot of brands, and for the energy drinks, this was the biggest, and now for the food companies, like uh, Baja Beef Jerky, you see them coming in for the Mint 400. What they really want is sampling. If you can show that you can give samples to a ton of people who might buy their food, that's what they want. How many times do you go to a grocery store and you buy an unfamiliar, strange brand of food? Never. There's a weird thing. I've never heard it before. Hmm, let me buy it and try it. No, we don't do that. We only buy what we've already tasted and what we like. So sampling is really important for a lot of brands. Um, if you can do that and show that you can offer sampling, that's going to get, it's really going to attract a lot of attention. One thing that you can do, and we learned this actually with COVID last year, is you know, there weren't a lot of races. 
<laughs> at least not at the beginning, but you can still make appearances. You can still do things. You can either appear online or you can appear in person. You can still work for your sponsor. You can still create value for them. You can, you can do a lot of things that you could potentially value. Ron Caps once told me that he spends more time at Napa Auto Parts stores than he does at racetracks. Why do you think they just renewed with him and now he's going private? You know, think about that. It's not about what you do at the track. It's about what you do all year long, especially when you're not at the track. When you're not at the track, that's when you can create the most value. When you're at the track, you have hundreds of other competitors and they're competing with all the other things that you're doing and all the other brands. And there's a logo dilution that's called, we call it sponsor soup. But when you're alone promoting, that has value. And if you can show that value to, to a potential brand, they, they usually say yes. Some other things that you want to put in a proposal are a budget for PR. Too often, racers and sanctioning bodies, tracks promoters will get a sponsor and they'll take all the money and they'll spend it on technology or improvements or operations. That's not what a sponsor wants. A sponsor wants you to take their money and spend it on marketing. So I always, it's, it's a rough number, but I always take about 20% of the money that, that I get from sponsorship and I reallocate it. And I'll, you know, perhaps we can't do anything this month or this quarter in terms of visibility because there's COVID. So you buy ads, take the money and just buy the damn sponsor some publicity. Show them that you're putting their money to work. Don't just keep it and spend it. Don't buy new parts for your car. Use, use the money, use part of the money to improve your racing and to improve your practice and your, your operations, but use some of the money to actually be an agent for the sponsor by buying them media in an area that's relevant. That's super important. It can either be online, it can be on social media. One of the things that I found, especially recently, COVID sort of changed a lot because COVID made us all jump online and we learned that a digital community is now growing fast and as viable and as important as a physical community. But a digital community can get diluted. I mean, Twitter turned off our president. If, 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 if a social media has so much power that they can cut you off instantly or change their algorithm where now you don't reach anybody, you send a Facebook message to 500 of your friends and six of them get it, but you gotta pay to reach the others. Yeah, that's wrong. So if you can form a one-on-one -on -one relationship with your, with your fans, a brand's customers by collecting an email address. It's as simple as an email address. Then you can then continue communicating with them. Hey, look, I'll be at the race next weekend. Come, come visit. Or here's my schedule. The one-on-one -on -one relationship's key. And, and if you can collect that data for sponsors, that's what they're looking for. They're also looking for data of who's attending. And it's, it's a little harder to do because you got to get people to fill out survey forms. And not everybody wants to fill out a survey form. I usually don't. But if you can keep a survey form three questions, five questions, you might get just enough demographical data to add value to a brand where they, they view you as their in-field marketing um, information person. And I was talking, uh, who's it with? I was talking with uh, Michael Mathis. He's the owner of Arturo Tires. I don't know if he's here, but we were just talking yesterday, a couple days ago here at PRI, where, and I told him a story where about 15 years ago, BF Goodrich, wanted to know who was in the audience of one of our off-road races and what kind of vehicles they drove and what tires they had. I don't know, you know, we had demographics that we sent out from the series. Oh, here's who our demographic is. BF Goodrich is like, no, let's get a golf cart. Let's drive down the parking lot, up and down every single row of the parking lot, write down what make and model vehicle and what tires they had. It took all day, but we did it. We came back with perfect information of how many cars, how many trucks, what tires were on what, and that was beautiful information for BFG. They were able to make a lot of decisions from that. So easy to do, it's just time consuming. That stuff adds value. That's how you can go to work for a sponsor. Putting your logo on your race car doesn't do as much as going up and down a parking lot and telling them how many tires, how many BFG tires are on how many pickup trucks. That's key. So lead generation, surveys, things like that. Sponsors, like I said, when, when you give someone a proposal, it's gonna to go to the marketing director who'll take it to the CFO, who'll take it to the CEO, and if you can show that you're gonna, your plan, your marketing strategy, your team strategy, fits in with the company's strategy, 
then you're going to get their attention. So show that you have a strategy. What is your marketing strategy? Do you guys have it in your proposals now? Does it show what you're going to do to market? Or does it just show, give me money, give me money, give me money, and I'll give you exposure? That's what I used to do. <laughs> That's when I wasn't selling very much. You also, obviously, what goes in the proposal, you have to put compensation incentives. Who's going to get paid what? Um, no, I guess number of the last one there, percentage of funds to be used for media is very similar to the first one, which is uh, you know buying PR. But this system works, and I literally went from about a 5% success rate to about half, I'd say 50%. Sometimes you feel real good, and you think you're going to close a deal, and pff, nothing. But about half the time, if you use this approach as opposed to a random approach where you think a decadent proposal are all the same thing, you can make money. Guys, like I said, everything that I said right now is in the book. The book is free until tomorrow night on my website. You can download it at alexstrather.com. Um, I also have some resources that I've been starting to put up. It's new to me because I just started this during COVID, and you know, about six months ago it started gaining traction. I'm making videos which, where I interview brand managers to what, and what they want for sponsorship. It's called Meet the Sponsors. You can hear from VP Racing Fuels, Lucas Oil, Permatext, Vision Wheel, Coca-Cola. Um, I have about 17 more now lined up for next year, or this year, sorry. No, next year, January, where I literally have a one-hour conversation with brand managers and sponsorship directors, and they tell you, uh, they tell me, and you can be on the call, what they want from sponsorship. It's the most valuable resource out there, because if you're approaching, I don't know, let's say Coke, what does Coke want? Well, Al Rondon will tell you. So I have free webinars, go to that. I take highlights of those, and I put them on YouTube. I'm not real good at it yet, so one video doesn't link to the next, but we're figuring out how to do all that. And uh, my son keeps telling me, Dad, you gotta start writing a blog. It's like, when do you have time to do all this stuff? I don't know, I'm trying, so I am putting stuff up. But if you go to alexstrother.com, you can download the book. It has everything you need. I also decided for PRI, anybody who wants uh, to get a hold of the workshop and thank you for taking photos, you get it free. But anybody else will get 60% off until tomorrow night of anything that's on the website. It's my PRI special. Uh, I will open it to questions. You can line up at that microphone right there. I know I threw a lot out at you, but honestly, guys, that's it. That's how you do it. It's pretty simple. I, I know you want to step by step by step by step, and at the end, you're going to make a lot of money. Well, this is how you do it. Does anybody have any questions? And, you, and I'll stay here for another half an hour or two. Oh, we have our first question. We have a couple. Come on up to the microphone. And um, Yes, sir. For those of us who are optically challenged, could you spell your last name, please? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm one of those same people, right? Uh, it's, it's one L in Stryler, S-T-R-I-L-E-R. A-L-E-X, Alex Stryler, S-T-R-I-L-E-R. Thank you. I'll, re I'll remember that. The qu uh, I have a question on, on uh, making proposals and, and sending decks. One of the things that I've run into is a lot of companies use advertising agencies. And advertising agencies seem to look upon racing sponsorships or any affiliation with racing as anathema. And I suspect part of that is because it's not commissionable like selling TV ads is. Can you give us some advice on that when you run into one of those guys? Yeah, I, it, so <laughs> I, have a, I have a great story. Um, before I was able to bring Polaris on board as a sponsor, uh, it took five years to get Polaris on board as a sponsor. When they came on board, it was, it was a good sponsorship, mid six figures. But when I first gave them a proposal, I gave them over a million dollars worth of value. Um, they had visibility in over a thousand races. They had television time, commercials. It was an incredible package that they should have said yes to. Well, they sent it to their agency to review. And their agency didn't know racing. And the agency is no longer with them, just as a clear, uh, you know, disclaimer there. And uh, when the old lady who was the agent reviewed the value of that sponsorship, she said, Mav TV is not rated, zero. There's a zero value to anything on Mav TV. CBS Sports, believe it or not, is an unrated network. Zero value. They're, they had hundreds of commercials on CBS Sports. She said zero value because, hey, it's not rated. If it's not rated by Nielsen, we don't know their numbers, so we give it zero. 
She said, banners at the track? We don't know what that's worth because we don't know who's in attendance. Zero value. She came back and she took a million dollar sponsorship proposal and gave it a $10,000 value. That's what I learned from agents. So I actually interviewed Bob Walker, who's Brian Deegan's agent. He represents Haley, uh, Danger Boy, Brian. He is on one of the Meet the Sponsors webinars, and he talks all about agents and agencies, how to deal with agents, what their, their commission structure is. Um, agencies use a term, it's called net or gross. If you offer an agency a sponsorship, let's say for $50,000 gross, then that is the full amount of money that the company is going to pay your race team. If you, on, if you offer them 50000 net, then it's 50000 less a commission, so, or after the commission for the agency. So you may, the, the best way what I've learned, and I've dealt with agencies probably about a 20, 20-25%, I think, of the, the deals I did are through agencies. You have to let them know that the numbers are either gross or net and that they're going to get paid. And what often happens is the agency double dips because they're getting paid by the brand anyway. But if you can show them that you're going to give them a little something too by giving them net versus gross, then usually you can get the deal done. I had the same problem. It's not fun. Yes? So when you're looking at building a deck, I think one of the bigger things that we kind of face is there's you know a ton, millions of companies out there that we could all reach. But as you'd mentioned with, with regards to the gatekeeper, one is how do you find out how to reach that person, right? Because the way that websites are built today is you don't have an open selection of email addresses. It's usually just a link that takes you right to you know like a form, and you never get to see who that person is. So you get stopped before you even get to the gatekeeper if you even know how to get to that gatekeeper. Yeah, the gatekeeper is an interesting one because you know what, what happens here. You'll probably meet 50 different marketing directors here at PRI just for Chevrolet alone. Everybody down in that Chevy booth has a, has a title of marketing. Marketing coordinator, marketing da-da-da, whatever. And when you see marketing on the business card, you think, oh, marketing, yeah, I'm going to give them a deck. No, that's not the right person. There's only one way to do it. And honestly, you call up reception. And the receptionists usually don't stay with companies very long. They rotate, so they're very honest. And you ask the receptionist, I'm so-and-so. Uh, who is the head of sponsorships? And I found that probably nine times out of ten, the receptionist will say, oh, that's Tom Bogner over at Lucas, or that's Brandon Bernstein, or that's da-da-da. And they'll give you the actual name of the person. Now, connecting with that person is a whole different challenge because they're probably not going to answer the phone. They usually don't, especially sponsorship people, because they know it's going to be a racer or sanctioning body looking for money. So the trick is to somehow reach them and communicate with them. Finding out who they are is not hard, but getting their email address can be a little bit more challenging. What I usually do is I meet someone else in the company. I try to meet a salesperson first because they don't care. They don't, every salesperson will talk to you. You meet someone in sales to get to somebody in marketing. That's, that's my trick. It's kind of a little inside tip. If I ever want to get to know somebody, just meet someone else and then have that person make the introduction. We need to lower that microphone, I think. It might be too high. Hi. Hi. And then I'm going to walk up and have the same issue. Um, so I am an aspiring racer. Uh, I'm starting out in HPDE right now, and I picked up a small sponsorship from a suspension company. And I'd like to uh, go forward and continue to try to gain momentum, not only with them, but with several other people that might want to come on board, like for harnesses, belts, and all that stuff, safety. But I'm struggling to figure out how to find value or provide value for them when you're just at the HPDE level. You know, how do you how do you convince them to get in at the ground level and support you and go forward? So what I do, and a lot of you guys are not gonna like hearing this because it delays everything by about a year, but I always I, I do the Netflix thing. Is if there's someone who I really can't convince that there's value who might give me money right away. I usually give them a free sponsorship the first time around. Sometimes it's for an event. Um, I gave Home Depot four free events before they became interested, but I had to show them how we were gonna drive construction workers, which we were in areas that there were, there were a lot of growth and building, how we were gonna drive construction workers into Home Depot stores. We linked it with one of the tool brands that was already a sponsor, and we did promotions through the tool brand to get people to go to Home Depot. But Home Depot got probably $300,000 $300, worth of value for free 
for those first four sponsorships, um, which we gave them. Uh, you, you, it's, it's one of those things where you give out free candy to get them interested. And the problem is, if they are interested, now you need to create that value, which will then link them with your current sponsors, hopefully, and it will grow. Well, like, yeah, I mean, their product is already on my Miata, so it's just like, uh, how do I show them that even though it's a small event, small time, and I'm, yeah, I just, I want to show them that there is value in the long run of stay, sticking by me. I don't want them to just say, you know, this wasn't worth it or something like that, so. Has your, has your reach through social or online been enough to attract their attention? If, if you can drive traffic to their website or their stores through your digital efforts, I think that would add a lot of value without knowing the specifics of your program. Um, that's what a lot of, a lot of racers did that during COVID. And I think the Deegans did a great job. There were no races at the beginning of COVID, but man, Brian got out there and, and what Bob Walker says in his webinars, they doubled down on their, their online media presence. And that added so much value, Ford renewed, Monster renewed, and it was good for them. Thank you. Hi, Alex. Hi. I'm, I'm Debbie. Hi, Debbie. Um, I want to say I've uh, attended several of your webinars. They are fantastic. I would tell everybody oh, you. in this room, you need to do that. I have learned so much from about four of them. And I took that information and condensed it down and did highlights and, and was able to key focus in on what different companies, businesses are looking for. My takeaway is you need to go to companies and say, what can we do for you? There you go. What can yes, I do for yes. you? What can our team do for you? And let me model our program based on what your needs are. So I want to tell you how valuable your, the webinar is. Ah, well, thank are. you. And, and you're right about that is if you can become an extension of a company's marketing arm, you know, what can I do to help you market where you're not marketing because you don't have the resources? I go to these races over here. All your marketing people are over here, but I'll be here for you and let me market on your behalf. A smart marketing director might see the value and allocate money. So, yes, you are ex exactly right. Okay, and my other question is, how valuable is LinkedIn to connect with businesses? Yeah, so I, I hate being online, and I hate social media, and I hate it all because I'm trying to disassociate and just live a, a comfortable life out in the country, but uh, it's very valuable. It's, it's been a great way to learn about um, what interests people because I use LinkedIn. I guess I probably have several thousand um, connections on LinkedIn, and many of them will message me, although I really don't meet, read LinkedIn messages very often. It's not my, my preferred tool for communication. But if I want to know where someone went to school, where they grew up, who they're associated with, I'll use LinkedIn to get to know somebody a little bit better, perhaps before I have a phone call or a conversation with them. So I use it a lot. Okay, thank you for being Trying not to, but I do. It's like, how do you get away from social media, right? Well, guys, thank you for coming in. Thanks for joining. It's busy here. If, <laughs>